Welcome to another episode of the Evolution of Business show. I'm your host, Dave Clare, and on today's episode, I'm very excited to introduce to you Mr. Steve Rogers. No, not Captain America Steve Rogers, although my good friend Steve, I reckon, would qualify to be an Avenger in my books. Uh, but Steve's going to take us on a journey of how he's gone from ego to Iggy, and ego being edging good out to now Iggy being inviting good into his life. There was a time in Steve's life when the universe tapped him on the shoulder because Steve looked like he might be losing all the things that were very important to him if he didn't make some soul change in his life. Uh, this all was happening while Steve was actually leading one of the largest real estate agencies in the United States and working with Warren Buffett at the time. Now, since been coached by a monk, he practices executive Zen and he finds calm in the chaos and he's going to share his journey on how he's done all that. So sit back, relax, get out your pen and paper and get ready to write down some of the epic points from Steve Rogers. Welcome to the Evolution of Business podcast. Business is a series of evolutions. This podcast explores how to stay relevant in the hearts and minds of the people you choose to serve. It will look for the lessons and the failures of the past and share the success of those getting it right today. What is the next evolution of your business? Now, here's your host, Dave Clare. Welcome back to the Evolution of Business show. I'm your host, Dave Clare, and today, I have a very special guest that I've been waiting to interview on this podcast. Uh, Steve Rogers is our guest today. Now, Steve lives near San Diego with his beautiful wife, Mary Lou, who I've had the pleasure of meeting both of them uh, at a conference a few years ago. But they also have a trusted golden retriever. I'm not sure if there's too many golden retrievers that aren't trustworthy, but theirs is the most <laughs> trusted golden retriever. <laughs> now, when not coaching and consulting, Steve enjoys bike riding, yoga, meditation, and spending time with his children and grandchildren. And I always think that's a sign of a, of a great success story, a great business person. It's all about family first, business second, uh, as you would have experienced if you listened to any of the other podcasts that we've done here on the Evolution of Business show. But let me tell you about Steve from a business point of view now. Steve Rogers is the author of the Amazon number one best-selling book, Led to Gold, which I have a copy of here in my office. And he's soon to launch his new book, The IGI Principles, which I'm sure he will share with some information about that to us. And you'll all find out that I believe that IGI stands for inviting good in. Uh, he's also the creator of the Alchemy Advisors coaching and consulting firm. He's actually a former Warren Buffett CEO who experienced a radical spiritual transformation that evolved into a new mission as a purpose-driven, words to my heart, purpose-driven consultant and entrepreneur coach. And he's an in-demand international keynote speaker and best-selling author. Now, Steve specializes in helping business owners and leaders increase profits while bringing spiritual intelligence into every aspect of their personal and professional lives. This helps them to invite in success, fulfillment, and abundance beyond their wildest dreams. And I'm not sure about you, but who wouldn't want success, fulfillment, and abundance beyond our own wildest dreams? Steve recognizes himself as a spiritual being having a human experience, which also is something that I am very, very hold dear to my heart. Uh, and his purpose is to help each individual discover their purpose and maximize their highest good in life and business. Without further ado, I would love to welcome my good friend, Steve Rogers, to the Evolution of Business show. Welcome, Steve. Hey there, everybody. Hey, Dave. How are you, dude? Mate, it is so great to, to see you again uh, in this crazy world and these crazy times. But here we are, uh, still able to connect. Uh, mate, and, and as I was saying to you before we started recording, you're looking fantastic. Uh, obviously, lockdown has been good for you. <laughs> yeah, a little bit more yoga, a little bit more running, uh, having a healthy delivered food to my house to make sure I'm proportionately eating the right stuff. So, uh, and uh, definitely I realized it's relieved some stress as well because I was traveling quite a bit and I enjoy traveling normally, but when you only have to commute from your back of your house through the yard to your office, it's a pretty uh, easy gig, right? <laughs> yeah. So your office is separate to your house, although you're in your home property? Yeah, we have a, a property and I'm lucky enough that my office is outside and there's a yard away from like a, a, a yard with green and stuff. And then my house is over there. So when I leave, my, I tell my wife, going to work, babe. And I literally walk out the door and I walk through the yard and go to my office. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, it, it is funny here in lockdown because I've always worked from home for the last probably three years almost now. Um, and so you would think it would be no, no shift or change for me in my house. 
Uh, but my wife uh, said, you need to move your home office. I said, I, I can't, I have to work from home. And she goes, no, no, <laughs> you need to move your office from where it is in the home to another location in the home. Oh, got it. Because while I was uh, pre-lockdown, I was always out and about and this is where I did sort of work. But, but now because I'm doing all these Zoom calls or, you know, live meetings and everything like that, it, our, my office was out to the back of our house, which then were the pool and entertaining areas. So when she would get back home from a round of golf and want to have a glass of wine with the ladies or whatever and have some music playing, she couldn't because my office was there and I needed quiet around. So I had to move my office to the front. So <laughs> even working from home, I still had you still have to adjust working from as, home. As the world is right now, we're all adjusting <laughs> in big or little small ways. Uh, and I, I've talked to a lot of friends and clients and associates that are really, you know, especially if they have kids that are now at home, you know, or they're homeschooling, or one of the, uh, you know, spouses or partners worked at home and the other one didn't. And now with them both working from home and then both vying for Zoom calls, like you said, and the, yeah. the acoustic of it, it's definitely created some interesting dynamics in families, uh, many positive and, and some not so, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's a changed world, no doubt. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that towards the end here, about the, you know, the, 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 the future of uh, the world in terms of work, leadership, humanity, technology, and everything like that. But to get us started, Steve, could you just share with the audience, you know, give us the Steve Rogers story. You know, um, just, you know, and it is such a, like going through your bio, there's so much that you've done and accomplished and just to get you to where you are today, just if you could give us some of the highlights of that journey, if it's possible, some of the milestones and the, uh, the ups and downs in the next 10 minutes or so, just share with us, uh, you know, how did you get to be this amazing human being that's doing all the work that you're doing today in the world? Oh, well, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Well, as you were reading my bio parts of that, I'm like, it sounds like Dave, you should be reading your own bio there. I remember when we met at that conference a few years ago that Joanne put on, um, Joanna, and, um, you know, we, we just instantly connected. You spoke and you also did some emceeing and you were like doing breakout sessions and everyone was just kind of gravitated to you. Uh, and I met you and then I spoke and after you spoke, I spoke and you spoke, we both were like, damn, we're like very common in our messages. And, you know, we just instantly hit it off the way we think and the way we live our lives and. Uh, how we want to inspire. So, uh, you know, kudos to the work you're continuing to do there. Uh, Thank you. I, I was so thrilled to see you doing the show because part of your title and subtitle of the evolution is part of what Alchemy Advisors is about. The subtitle of Alchemy on my company is Transition, Transform, and Evolve. Um, uh. And so very much aligned again. So kindred spirits. Uh, let's see the Steve Rogers story. I'll try and give you the, the, the short version. Um, over the last few years, the Steve Rogers uh, thing has become pretty funny because the Marvel series with Captain yes. America uh, has been like resurged. And when I used to check in the hotels months ago, checking in the hotels or restaurants or reservations, I'd say, you know, Steve Rogers and they're like, 80% of the time, they'd look up and go, like Captain America, Steve Rogers? And I was like, uh, yeah, I guess I'll take that on, Captain America, Steve Rogers. Because yeah. before that, in my early days, uh, not that it was a bad thing, but uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. In the United States, Mr. Rogers was yes. a big show guy. And then Tom Hanks just did a movie about him recently yeah. called Mr. Rogers. So when, as I was growing up, I always got Mr. Rogers. Where can I be in your neighborhood? Where's your neighbor? So I always got this <laughs> Mr. Rogers stuff. And I thought, oh, Mr. Rogers, Captain America. I think I'll lean towards Captain America. But uh, anyway, let's see my story. <laughs> uh, Rogers' family. My, my Rogers' name with my dad, military guy got married to my mom after meeting her six months um, and they were celebrating yes to yesterday their 59th wedding anniversary uh, my dad was a military guy uh, and they had five boys in seven years so wow. they were just kind of popping kids out and you know and we were a military family so I traveled uh, being a Navy brat on the east coast of the United States and we were always moving and doing different stuff um, you know very traditional kind of uh, strong-willed family my dad being a military man and it was a great upbringing, lots of challenges with having five boys and a male military father in a house. Uh, and much of that is his way or no way. Uh, and part of his mantra was, this is my house, these are my rules, and if you don't like it, you can get out. And yeah. you know, that was not, never expecting the kids like to fly the nest that early. Well, at 17, um, I took him uh, literally uh, and ended up moving out of the house at 17 and finished my last year of high school on my own. And then from there on, I just kind of took off and started learning the knots of life. So that became my journey, um, having a really challenged uh, relationship with a very strong dad and being bullheaded and stubborn and driven and wanting to prove something to people. Yeah. That, that later served me in my career as I started climbing the ladder. 
So that led mm -hmm. to moving um, out. Uh, I finished uh, last year of high school. I mean, my last year of high school. Uh, and most of my family had not really been in college or didn't, wasn't the academia. They were military, they were blue collar type workers, and it wasn't a very academic type family. And I always felt odd about that. And I said, God, if I'm going to be somebody, I've got to get a college degree. I mean, so I went out and started thinking, I better go to community college um, and see if I can get some uh, cred under my belt. And long story short, I never ended up finishing college and uh, it was not my cup of tea. I ended up not being the academia that uh, I thought maybe I had of the Rogers gene to carry on. So I did like maybe a couple years of community college and realized, okay, I better get into something different. So from restaurant to bartending to that led to eventually moving to California, which is a whole other story in itself. Uh, California, I went from the restaurant business into real estate. Uh, and I started selling houses as a, as a salesman. And that led from real estate sales in Southern California. Um, and that led into management and then management eventually into executive management. And on that path of going from, wow, I don't have a college degree and am I ever gonna be somebody kind of thing as a 17 year old and trying to break into the world. When I started getting in the real estate space, especially in Southern California, people who were buying houses at a million, two million, five million, five hundred thousand, you know, it, it was a lot, a different change of me going from where I lived at the time in Indiana. So I, I lived in the Midwest of the United States, which is very conservative and very kind of, uh, you know, uh, you know, not, not, it's not LA. I'll just put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely not LA. So going to LA and San Diego, I quickly learned the new way of life and I just excelled. I just really did what I was told to do. I was driven. I was passionate, I was hungry, and that evolved on a ladder going through the real estate industry of really being my launching ground to start creating some success. I uh, started creating some wealth, started buying houses, um, all the toys that came along with that. Um, and as, as things started climbing, I became from a manager in a company to a regional manager and then a vice president and then a president and then eventually a CEO uh, of a very large real estate company in Southern California that was doing about 35,000 transactions a year and about 25 billion in sales volume. Wow. Uh, so it was a pretty big operation. And it was mm. very cool to be part of that because when I started with it, it only had 10 real estate offices. And after a 15 year history, as our team grew and we built, we went from 10 offices to 110 offices, 110 offices, and went from like 500 salespeople to 5,000 salespeople. Wow. Uh, and it was a dominant player. And then Warren Buffett, mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier, bought yeah. that company. Uh, and so I worked under Warren Buffett Home Services of America, which was a division of Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, and, I, I, and I worked under that for seven of those years. Uh, so I went from being in this entrepreneurial space to then get, being in a very corporate structure. Uh, and I remember when I first met Warren Buffett, uh, and I've met him numerous times after that. But, you know, I was like so nervous to meet him because I was like, you know, I, I was like, God, I'm meeting Warren Buffett, the richest man in the world kind of thing. And, and the oracle of finance and, you know, yeah. a, a brain like no other. And, you know, his recall is amazing. So uh, we had a small group that went and flew back to Omaha and he came to a cocktail party of ours and then a dinner. And um, after meeting him, it was just, uh, it, it was really just so eye opening about how intelligent, successful uh, unique individuals can be so open and so warm and so transparent and so authentic in who they are. And what I learned about Warren Buffett and many other people that I met, and it's not always this way with successful people, but someone like a Warren Buffett uh, is so comfortable in his skin about mm. who he is and who he is not. Um, like he's really, like when you're at that level of just having to be laser beamed on what you do and what you do well and farming everything else out or not trying to put on airs, if you will, it was a great lesson to meet somebody who was so humble, so kind, so generous, so intelligent, so brilliant, but also very warm and so inviting to any question you could ask him. So it was a great lesson of, as people climb the ladder of success, um, many of them can become more giving and more generous and more humble, not less. So I wanted to make sure I continued to emulate that. Um, and then years later, I uh, ended up leaving corporate America because not by choice, but I actually ended up getting fired uh, after after seven years of running the, the company under the Berkshire system, which was great. And I was uh, kind of always king of the hill. But in 2008, as you probably remember, it started in yep. the U.S. but trickled to the rest of the world, yep. uh, was the economic meltdown. And we went from this level of being at the top of the food chain to yep. crashing and burning. And uh, about a year, year and a half 
into that. Uh, I had to fire almost half the company, closed half the offices. We were slashing stuff left and right. Banks were closing up left and right. Yeah. Um, and I was very vocal at the time about what was working, what not working. And long story short, I made a lot of money uh, and I uh, was being too rebellious for them, just like I was with my dad about telling yeah. them how they were effing things up at this point, not Warren yeah. directly, but the underlings under him. And that led to me getting fired, starting my own real estate company. I ran yeah. that for five years. And then we'll talk about this later in the call, but then the calling and the transition of my evolution came to really following even more of my heart and breaking yeah. out and starting the Alchemy uh, Alchemy Consulting Company that you already mentioned. So yeah, that's absolutely. A, so that's a, a a version probably longer than you needed or wanted, but no, uh, that's perfect, mate. That's uh, it's giving me a lot of stuff. I've got a whole bunch of questions uh, that have just come from that alone. So thank you for that. Uh, <clears throat> and it, you know, firstly, uh, what what I did love that you said, and I uh, certainly. I, I, you know, I knew that you and I are very kindred spirits, but like uh, I started my uh, master's, my MBA, and did one year of it and ended up not doing it. So uh, I got my executive certificate in management. So you know, I'm, thinking, I'm just chuckling away at myself when you're talking about starting your <laughs> degree. And I was much the same. Um, and not that there's anything wrong with uh, uh, education in that sense. It just, it just didn't fit with me in, in terms of what I wanted. Right. And I thought I needed a piece of paper, but it turned out I didn't. Right. Um, for me, it wasn't for what I wanted to move forward. But I really love the fact that one of the things that I did in, you know, in my book, Simplified, which you were so kind to put a testimonial in, um, was that uh, a lot of the leadership principles that I, that I talk about are what I've learned from leaders. I've learned from every single leader or manager I've ever had um, what I liked or didn't like. And, you know, listening to you talk about, you know, what you learned from people like Warren Buffett and things like you'd like to emulate. Uh, and that. I think it's such an important part of our own evolution. Um, you know, in terms of as human beings, but also from a leadership point of view, right? Is, you know, <clears throat> learning from all those people, and you you would have learned from leaders that you to learn things you didn't want to do either, as well, right? But the yeah, um, which helps shape us because we we get to observe and watch and go. I like that. I don't like that. I would love to be able to be like that. I want to be like that. I don't want to be like that. Um, exactly. and, I, and I thought that was fascinating. Um, but one of the things where you um, you have such experience where a lot of people don't is that you've been a corporate CEO, a business owner, and probably what one might call a serial entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. How would you define the difference between those three things? You've had like numerous roles and you know, each one required different skill sets, I would think, although there might be some similarities. So when, when you look at a corporate CEO, business owner, and a serial entrepreneur, how do you, how do you differentiate those? Yeah, that's a good, very good question. And I've thought about that numerous times, and especially when I knew we were going to be on the show and I saw some of your questions. Mm -hmm. And looking back on it, and I have been all those things. And at the time when I was in corporate America and, dry, and, and, and going above and beyond and, and growing quickly, it was very trackable and very measurable and very systematic that you knew if you got this position, you make this much money, you did this, you got these bonuses, you did this, you got these titles. So it was like in the corporate world, it was like if you played their game and yeah. played their scenario, you could benefit really well financially and in status and in self-esteem and on all those things because you had seen how the pattern of the company was laid out. Um, yeah. And that's not a bad thing. But what happens is sometimes you get trapped in that. And I started realizing I was getting trapped in that and the bubble in which I was in was consuming so much of my energy and time to check all those boxes and run through the races and jump the hurdles and make everything happen so I could accomplish that, I realized I always felt like I was running a race and mm -hmm. I de don't feel like I was always fully contributing. Um, and so looking back on that, that's one of the things. When I switched into running my own company and then I called all the shots and wrote all the checks and they had to make payroll and went through the ups and downs, the same pressure that I had in the corporate world of the, the pressure of it, I made sure I wanted to try and eliminate in my new company. So yeah. I made a lot of policies and culture changes within my group that allowed it to be more of a free flowing kind of environment, awesome. but still realizing that you still needed structure and you still needed coherence to make the operation run well. So I definitely pulled a lot of my the acumen, the business acumen I had of being a CEO and understanding P&Ls and balance sheets and budgets and HR and all that stuff that was just primed in but I focused more on culture and people and self-development in my own company than I did in the corporate world. Uh, right. And then as a serial entrepreneur, um, I explain to people now, part of the, the main thing of a serial entrepreneur is that I am a consultant and a coach and a board advisor, now an author. And many of those things feel very different. And now that I've been a grandparent for a few years, <laughs> being corporate America CEO, owning my own company that's an operating business where you have lots of employees and rents and ex all of that stuff versus the way I work now on a lifestyle type business, it's the difference between being a parent and being a grandparent. Yeah. Um, 
So as, as a parent, when you're the CEO, you are like all in, you're, I mean, it's mm -hmm. like, you know, intense. And then when you're the owner, for sure, and you're writing every check and everything rises and falls, if you don't make money, if people don't get paid and you don't man, man, you know, manage the books right or you hire the right people, that's also intense. But as this lifestyle, the last five years, I feel like um, when I consult, when I coach, when I advise, when I do serial entrepreneur of either investing in things, it feels more like I feel now as a grandparent, that when I have my grandkids, I love them. I want the best for them. I'm fully present. I am uh, enamored. I love them. But then they get to go home. And yeah. I'm on to my next thing. I'm on to my next life thing. So what's happening as a serial entrepreneur is I get to have a lot of grandkids uh, yeah. in my serial uh, business. And I don't have to be a parent to one major thing that consumes all of me. That's such a great uh, analogy. You know, I'm, I'm just resonating with my own, with all the clients that I, uh, you know, that I get the privilege to serve is uh, that's probably exactly how I, I feel that they're all my, ch my grandchildren, but like, you know, I, I do what I need to do that I, and then I had the parents are the owners of the company per se, and then they, they take it and it's nice to visit with them and hang out with them and help them and share some experience. Um, but my, my brain also was working when you were talking about the difference between the, obviously the corporate CEO, the business owner and the serial entrepreneur, um, you know, my little clarisms and things like that. So uh, what I was saying, when you're a corporate CEO, you take the rules and you apply them. When you're business owners, you get to make the rules and apply them. And then when you're a serial entrepreneur, you get to break the rules. <laughs> so you can take the rules, make the rules, or break the rules. It's your choice. I like that. I'm going to make sure I listen back to this recording so I can actually get that down and reuse that again. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll, I'll put that up in, in the in the in the show notes as well uh, for that, and you might find it come out as a clarism, and yeah. I'll tag you in the post for it for sure, mate. <laughs> um, uh, inspired by Steve Rogers, inspired by Captain America himself. The uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so, so thanks for that because I think it's really fascinating because there's you know. A lot of people also, you know, think that they're an entrepreneur if they're they bought a franchise, for example. And you know, whilst you're you maybe running a business, I don't I don't see that as being an entrepreneur. Because to me, an entrepreneur is somebody who starts something brand new. You know, buying a franchise, you can be a business owner, and that's great. But there's there's a subtle difference, or even maybe not even subtle, there's a blatant difference between each of them, and each one may require a different mindset. You know, when you're in that role, um, and, and I think that, that uh, you aptly described that. So we, like a grandparent has a totally different mindset to what a parent has. You know, and sometimes we, we're, we revel in the fact that we get to hand those children back and say, hey, they're yours again. Here you go. <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Good, good um, summary. Yeah. All right. So mate, thank you for sharing all that. Um, I do have another couple of questions, but they might come more when we get into looking at your own personal evolution, because I'm really fascinated because I know you've been through... Um, you know, it's through reading from your book, what I know of you and seeing what you're up to these days. But um, we'll talk about that shortly. But what I like to, this show is all about, you know, obviously the evolution of business. I challenge a lot of business owners and leaders and entrepreneurs around the fact that, you know, especially here in Australia, I don't know what it's like in the US, but we had this strong growth mindset and we're just growing, growing, growing our business, um, which is okay. But eventually organizations which have shown improvement to us over time, big organizations, small organizations, that they've grown into irrelevance or you know, grown into obscurity or faded away into the sunset because they didn't evolve. They didn't become or find ways to stay relevant in the hearts and minds of the people that they choose to serve. They might have just kept going after ways to drive more value for the shareholder than we lost sight of why our business really exists, which is to serve our customers. So growth is okay, but you've got to be mindful that if I challenge people, if evolution isn't the natural state of your business, uh, especially moving into the world that we're in, if it wasn't already, um, you're going to have a long, hard road ahead if you are lucky to survive at all. So how, right. how, what's your perspective on the difference between growth and evolution? Yeah, no, that is a really great question. Um, I don't think I've been asked that before. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Dave. Uh, there on that uh, <laughs> Put you on the spot. <laughs> no, but you, uh, I, you had prefaced that before. I've been thinking about it. Um, and I'm really big on that in my life. And I, and I, the, the easy answer, and I'll give you a longer one. The easy answer for me is um, from evolution to training or growth or um, learning is evolution is the difference of, we're, you know, we're in this technology world. It's the difference of if you have a whole new operating system that you've plugged in because you've now have new software running through your, your DNA of yourself. Yep. And growth is to me is like when you're adding new apps and new uh, additional, you know, small software programs that are making your essence of who you are easier in life. Evolution is where you're stepping into a whole new consciousness. 
that the DNA and the in, the operating system, it's almost like you've gone from a, a desktop to a Mac uh, and you've evolved into a new ecosystem of thinking. And once you're there, then that evolution either does or should, or always in my, in my experience has, then affects all other areas of your life. Where sometimes just growth affects only certain areas, but when you're evolving, you really have your whole soul that's changing vibration. And that yeah. your whole consciousness, it's, so what evolution is the soul change and growing into the soul change more into getting out of ego. And growth is more um, at, a, at, a, at a lesser level of that, but still important. Yeah, right. That is, uh, once again, your, your uh, metaphors are uh, on point. I just love that whole concept from the, the, visually I can understand, like if we upgrade our whole operating system, um, that is evolution. When we just add new apps and new functionalities, that's growth. Yeah, um, and it's just as simple as that, you know, me simplified. Um, and I love that, and that soul change of our organization. And, you know, the, uh, certainly one of the things, this is why I say in the hearts and minds of the people we choose to serve, because I want, uh, you know, I, I challenge leaders to find the soul of their organization. That, you know, we, there's all this talk, Steve, you know, you know, business, 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 consumer. Well, to me, it's all human to human. Businesses don't do business with businesses. People within businesses do business with people within businesses. Right. And so it's all human to human. And so as we're all souls, well, we need to speak to the soul of that human being uh, and help them realize how what we might be able to do is help them become more and, and you know, r raise their own vibration in terms of their success um, in the world or their life. And I think if we speak more in, in that space, and I think that's huge. So thank you. That's, uh, that's even better than my head. I'm going to you can take the take, make, and break, and I'm going to take that one, okay? Because <laughs> okay, you're on. <laughs> I, I just love that because, yeah, it uh, it's easy to understand, especially in a technologically advanced world. You know, are you upgrading your operating system or are you just adding new apps? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. and for, for the work that I do, I have like my next 90 business evolution process. It's like a whole process. It's not a program. It's not plug this program in. It's a whole new system for your organization. And that's why it resonated so strongly with me. Um, I don't know if you've read um, Atomic Habits by James Clear. No, I have not read that one oh, yet. I mean, great, great book. You'll love it. Um, I wish I wish this quote was a clearism, but it's not. So I have to give full credit to James Clear, uh, not Dave Clare, uh, for this. But he said, <laughs> you don't rise to the level of your goals. You only fall to the level of your systems. Hmm. So when you think about it in life, so it's about putting those operating yeah. systems in place for your health, for your well-being, for your family, for your organization, for evolution, for whatever it might be, your spirituality, it's, it's still, it's a system. It's a, like, so that whole operating system that you're talking about, if you're not upgrading the operating system, then you're really not evolving. Absolutely. You have the same operating like system, but you're plugging more apps into it. Well, then you're just doing more of what you're already doing. And to me, that's growth is just doing more to get more. Um, whereas evolving is maybe do, you're achieving more, but by doing less or doing different. Right, right. Very true. Very yeah. true. Well, I will, I will definitely read Atomic Habits. So I wrote yeah, that down. Yeah, it's great. Uh, on Audible, uh, I love it. It's been, uh, I do share that quote quite often because to me it is one of the most simple but fundamental quotes from a life point of view. And when you're talking about systems, it, uh, to me it always, uh, it always comes up that it's just, it's one of the, the, it was in chapter three, I think, or two or three. And I just like almost put the book down after that. I'm like, uh, I've, I've, learned, I've, I've got enough out of this book already, that one quote. Um, so let's talk about your, speaking of evolution, then, uh, how have you upgraded your own personal operating system, Steve? Like, uh, you know, this is some, what do you, reflect on your most significant personal evolution. It could be as a leader or just in life, but uh, it's up to you. Yeah, uh, some of my major evolutions I've had have been forced and some have been chosen. Mm. Um, and, you know, a lot of times when the universe is trying to get your attention and, and I call universe God, people can call whatever they want, mother nature, mm. you know, uh, God, higher power, you know, uh, yep. whatever it is. But for me, I use the word God and, and universe. And so for me, um, I always know that the universe is tapping on my shoulder every day and talking in my ear. Uh, and sometimes I'm listening and sometimes I'm not. Uh, lucky in these later years, I've been listening more and more frequently every minute of every day on, on the hour, where before I think I used to li listen maybe weekly or monthly because I was so busy doing what I was doing that I was not tuning in to really where my own evolution needed to be going. Uh, and so as you were talking about systems and processes earlier out of the Atomic Habits book, that also applies to spirituality. Mm. So for me, I realized I had to get operating systems in place and procedures 
that allowed me to focus on what was important to me. And I kept saying was important, which is spirituality and connecting with my higher power at a deeper level and being of service. So once I got systems and processes in place on a daily basis that I followed those processes, my evolution of consciousness started rising. And once I started rising in my consciousness, the pull for me to do something about it became overwhelming, that it started to affect massive change and it started to affect decisions on how I made decisions and who I surrounded myself with and who I listened to and uh, what I read. Um, and so um, as I started tuning into that, that's how I got into my chosen evolutions, i.e. Mm. You know, different things, lifestyles, changes, et cetera. Um, you know, becoming a vegan, eating healthy, losing weight, um, you know, one of, and then one of the big evolutions probably that I look back on and I, and I share a lot because it was such, such a big evolution is um, I had gotten to be a very overachiever, not only in my corporate life uh, and in my driven life, but in my 40s, late 30s, early 40s, I had also um, enjoyed alcohol quite a bit. Uh, and I had the motto of you work hard, you play hard, you work hard, yeah. you play hard. And a part of my corporate environment was cocktails every night, going out to dinner, et cetera. Uh, and after many years of doing that, it actually ended up catching up with me. And I was still mm -hmm. a very functioning, high level person, a, a personality, but I was a functioning alcoholic. Um, okay. And maybe not a personality, a for alcoholic, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and one night after many promises or things behind the scenes with the family, my daughter at the time, my daughter is now 34. So um, this was 18 years ago. Yeah. Um, she was 16 at the time. Uh, and this is back when they used to have yellow pages and the hard copy yeah. uh, stuff for phone books versus just, you know, Google up a number. Yeah. And I came, I came home from an event I was supposed to be at, uh, I was at, and I had made promises I wasn't going to drink on certain nights or do this or whatever. And I'm, she'd overheard that either with my wife uh, or she said it to her directly, I'm sure. And I came home one night and opened up in the middle of the big center island of our kitchen. We had a big center island and then space around that and then the kitchen. Um, and every, there was a, a wicker basket, like you put your laundry in yeah. big, and in that wicker, wicker basket, um, was every single alcohol bottle that I had in the house turned upside down and emptied and they were all in the wicker basket. And there was a, uh, a phone book, a yellow page phone book open at the time. And there was a note next to it. And the circle in the book was for AA and it oh, just wow. said, you, and it just said, you need help. Wow. And that was my daughter's uh, message to me, which was uh, the, uh, the start for me of awareness, not that the problem had been there, but mm -hmm. that if I didn't evolve past this, yeah. my life was going to start crumbling very quickly. Um, yeah. So I realized that I had turned a corner of realizing that I was no longer holding back stuff that I thought I was holding back and putting up the charade and putting up the thing that it really, if it had gotten to that core level of my 16-year-old daughter at that core level, there was no turning around from that point. I, I either was going to keep going down the path of being committed on being a functioning alcoholic and continue to lose relationships or whatever I did, or I knew I had to evolve. And I knew the only way I could evolve was by getting help. Mm. Uh, because at the time, I didn't know how to do what I wanted to do. So my first thing of evolution always is know where you want and how you want to feel when you evolve and then find help to get you on the track to getting there, regardless of what it is. Uh, for me, that was going to a, an alcoholic program and you know getting help and direction. And then I took to it like I do most things and I followed it to the letter of the law. And uh, I have not had a drink in 18 years. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. But I followed, their, I followed their processes. I followed their systems. I followed yeah. the procedures of what's supposed to happen. And it, and it worked just like in business. Yep, um, when you follow the system, you rise to the level of your, you follow the level of your systems. So you can set a goal to be that, but and your system is working, and therefore you're achieving your goals. Exactly. Uh, but, and, and thank you for sharing that. I would say a very personal um, part of your life there, uh, but obviously a great learning point. And you know, I've, from an emotional point of view, I can imagine what it must have felt like walking in there and knowing that your 16-year-old daughter, um, when you're starting your lifestyle, starting to impact your child, and we're there sitting there telling you. Um, yeah, like I, I remember when my uh, dad, bless him, he's still around today, which is fantastic, but he had a stroke. Um, they raced him to the hospital. I got to the hospital before he did. Um, and the ambulance got there and, uh, you know, he, the doctor told me he had to quit smoking. And as soon as I rolled up, he asked me to go buy him a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. And yeah. I'm like, no. Yeah. Good not happening. I mean, you know, ever since that, he's never smoked a day since. Um, oh, wow. That was 30 wow. years for him. But, 
Um, but I still remember that vividly as a, as a, 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 a I would have been 22, 23. And I'm like, just looking at your father, like, uh, and that, and I'm just like, no, nah, not happening. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, well, that's, um, that's powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like, like, luckily, you you were one of the tough love people that helped get that done for him, and he listened because some people don't. Um, mm. So I'm glad that he did, and you had all those after years, and he's had them as well. Um, and I'm glad I've now had those with my daughters, and now she has kids, and I have grandkids, and they're wonderful, and the relationships are so different with my grandkids than they were with my kids. Yeah. Uh, you know, at a much more present and deep level. But not everyone gets that message, you know. I call those brick upside the head moments. You know, sometimes yeah. we're talking about evolution. Sometimes yeah. evolution is chosen. Like I know I want to evolve, and you go on a quest, and you go on a mission, and you open yeah. up your life and thinking. And other times you're not evolving, and the universe or God wants you to be evolving, and you're just not getting it, and you're not listening. And then I call those brick upside the head moments, mm. where you get a car accident, you get fired, you get served with divorce papers you uh, lose a business partner, something happens that's so traumatic that the universe is going, okay, now are you listening? Uh, yeah. Now, let's see if I can shake up your head enough to see if your heart and your head can be shaken up enough to have new emotion and new energy going in, which looks like people going, oh shit, the world's falling apart. Yeah. And that's really where that old adage comes in of having breakdown before you have breakthrough. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, um, but not everyone's able to do that. You were talking about your dad, my, my wife, who I've been married to for 30 years this week, um her dad Happy anniversary, Mary Lou. <laughs> thank you when i go to the house yeah uh, yeah 30 years i went went fast and slow at times but it's you know it's a uh, very proud of that and she's a great lady and uh, mm. we've had an amazing journey but her dad um loved to smoke like your dad yeah. and he was uh, he was a, a heavy drinking irishman and yeah. he smoked two uh, packs of palm oil a day and he did not get that message of stop smoking from the doctor and stop drinking and listen to his kids uh, and he died at uh, 50, he, he died about my age. He died about 57, 58 years old, mm -hmm. uh, about a year or so after Mary Lou and I got married. Uh, but that's someone who didn't evolve. Yeah. They, they, they didn't listen to the signs. They didn't, they, they had either so deep in their addiction of smoking or drinking, in this example, her father, as, yeah. it, as things happen in the world. Sometimes people get so stuck that as much as the universe or God wants them to evolve, they just can't. Um, and their soul then gets tormented in that. And then that's yeah. where the whole of the soul starts becoming even more intense. Um, so I love that. Like that, that's a, especially like the, the hole in your soul gets, the bigger it gets, you fall into it. Right. And then that's, um, where you just end up disappearing because your, your soul is, yeah. And it's, uh, and it's challenged. So people listening to this, you know, please, if you are, uh, any of those spots, you know, there is people out there who can help. There are people who have been through what you're dealing with. It's, uh, it's such a powerful part of our own personal evolution is learning to, but when you overcome those, right? Like, and you sit back and you think about it now, um, and before we move on to business evolution, uh, there's a couple of key points I wanted to touch on that you really brought up, which were powerful. Um, but you know, when you actually break through those, it's, you set yourself up for imagining what else you could accomplish in life. Right? You sit there and think like, if I, if I managed to evolve through that and become who I am today, what else could I do? Who else could I become? What more, could I be in terms of a, as a human being and my gift and contributions to the world? And, and I think, you know, I love the fact that you said uh, chosen versus forced, uh, because right now a lot of people are being forced because of, uh, we're recording this during the middle of a pandemic, right? Um, regardless of people's opinions on the pandemic. Um, the fact is, uh, and I always joke, Steve, the, the best way I describe this to people is that mother nature, whatever you want to call, um, <clears throat> when my parents were mad at me because I was misbehaving, they would send me to my room, mm -hmm. right? And whether I liked it or not, I'd go to my room kicking and screaming and upset, and I don't want to go to my room. And they would lock me in my room, and then eventually I would calm down. And then I would have to think and reflect on my behavior, um, which was deemed by them as inappropriate in, in terms of societal in, interaction in, in our family society or in the overall right. society. And then right. I would have to go back, then I would have to have a chat with them and then say, hey, look, you know what I'm, um, you know, here's what I learned about sitting here in quiet peace and reflecting. And uh, can I come out of my room now? And, and I kind of almost think universally, the universe has sent us all to our rooms and said, you guys all need to go think about it. And people are kicking and screaming and upset and, and all this. <laughs> and once we all calm down, breathe, reflect on it, we might find that, you know, there's, you obviously, uh, this would probably not new to you, but you have two mindsets, victim or victor mindset. So victim mindset, this is happening to me, whereas victor mindset says, this is happening for me. And I decide how I choose to interpret this. 
And some of us might look back on this forced or thrust upon us um, uh, situation and go, it was the best thing ever happened for me. Because it might be the wake up call that a lot of us needed, that we've been in miserable jobs that we don't like. <clears throat> now I totally empathize 100% with people who are suffering financially, physically, mentally through this time. And I don't say this lightly, but we might find in two or three years time that you know I was living in, working in a miserable job that was tearing my soul apart. Um, or my lifestyle and everything like that. And this has been the wake up call that I needed to make that transformation. Because very more times than not, most of our evolutions have been forced upon us until you, people like you and I realize it's been forced so many times that all of a sudden we go, you know what, I might just start going from reacting to this instead of, you know, I'll start being proactive in my evolution. Right. Which Absolutely. is the place that I'm playing in now in my own life. Um, and I said, you can either affect change or you can be affected by change. Mm -hmm. um, and I just love what you were sharing there. And I think that this is a, you know, it's a wonderful lesson for all of us to learn that, you know, if, and once again, you know, the universe is just going to keep throwing it at you right. until you either learn or it goes, you're not going to learn. So, you know, that tap on the shoulder. Yeah. I mean, I've had that in my own health and well being, as we were discussing pre before the podcast uh, started right. my own health and challenges that I've had uh, over the past couple of years to where I am today. And if I hadn't listened to those taps on the shoulders from the angels or whoever they you want to call them, which just have to be just people who are around me tapping me on the shoulder, I might not be standing here today. Right, right. So glad you listened and so glad you took took action for sure. Yeah, yeah those, absolutely. That, that, those taps on the shoulder or those whispers in the ear or yep. the nudges that we get, sometimes they're, they're enough that we'll get enough of those and we'll take action. Or we only need a few and we learn. And when, when the universe says, okay, you're not listening to the tap on the shoulder, you're not listening to the whisper in your ear, you're not you know, listening to feeling the tug I'm giving you or the nudge, then that's when the brick upside the head goes. Yep. Boom. Boom. Um, and Mother Nature and God, and I think this whole thing with uh, uh, the uh, virus, uh, is I think that was a great analogy. And I agree with that 100%. Um, and it's, we were talking about operating systems before. Yeah. Uh, you know, in, in the world, globally, uh, now has to realize more than ever, even though we know we're a global society with, you know, you and I are in whole different countries yeah. having a conversation here and sipping coffee and iced tea. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we know that it's a global war world. But when you have pandemics and you have economic meltdowns globally because of something happening to everyone, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter what your eco, your economic issues are, doesn't matter your religion, your faith, your company, your, you know, anyone can be affected by this, this thing. Um, and that to me is mother nature and God saying, Hey, this is a hard reboot. Like you weren't taking the nudges. You weren't taking the taps mm -hmm. on the shoulder. The few software upgrades that we did on your updates on your iPhone, were not working as great. So you need to completely do a hard reset and you're not even doing that. So we're going to do that for you. Um, and I yeah. think that, you know, going in your room by your parents or the universe saying, Hey, w w w and, and we have to realize too, in the scope of time, and time is infinity, never ending, never beginning. Yeah. So for Mother Nature and God, this is like a half of a second uh, of, of whatever's going to happen in this whole time here. Yeah. Uh, and for us, months and months and months have gone by. But hey, it's already passed and there's more coming. And this will be something, like you said, whether you're going to be affected by it or affect, affect it, or you're going to be a victor or a victim. Uh, this to me is such a great Petri dish of challenging everybody to do exactly what you just said. And when you realize in life that you have a choice every single day uh, in how you live your life, doesn't mean that you get to choose how life outside of you lives. It doesn't no. mean you get to choose how the eco ecosystem of the world affects, but you do get to choose absolutely in every second of every thought, of every word, of every action, every deed, how you take and react and create from that. And a lot of times people say, I can't wait to get back to normal. I'm like, quit waiting. It's never going back to normal. Life yeah. is not supposed to stay normal. It's supposed to evolve and shift and flow. And if it's not a pandemic, it's going to be something else. So just prepare in the chaos of the world. The greatest gift we can learn is to be the calm in the chaos and to yes. be the still in the storm. You know, that calm in the chaos and still in the storm. Then if you're in that anchored spot all the time, you don't give a shit what's going around in the world. You give a shit if you can influence and you care with empathy. But I mean, you don't give a shit because you realize that the clouds are just continuing to change and your weather is always the same. Yeah. And I think that's so good at being the calm and the chaos. And, uh, and, and I really challenge people in that space is to find that, you know, there's, you know, the, I think it was Wayne Dwyer or whatever, the, you know, old cliche quote, but still cliches are cliches because they're true, but nobody ever listens to them. 
is, you know, if you want things to change, you know, change the way you look at things. And if you want the world to change, be the change in the world. Right. So you, Absolutely. I, I, <clears throat> I can waste all my time and energy worrying about why this happened, how this happened, all this sort of stuff. What I need to be thinking about is, you know, how am I going to choose to respond in this space? How am I going to choose to make, bring whatever I can to this space uh, and bring whatever good I can to the world because I may not be, have any control or influence of what everybody else is doing, but I always have control or influence over what I'm doing mm -hmm. um, and how I'm thinking and how I think determines how I act. So for me, um, I do the best that I can with what I have around me and help anybody else do the same. And if we all start doing that, well, then you know what? We might all be allowed out of our rooms and That's be able right. to play, play together <laughs> nicely out, again. We, and we that full play again. Yeah. <laughs> so, so let's talk about... Uh, and thank you so much for sharing that personal evolution um, space. It was great. Let's talk about then from a business evolution. What was the most significant evolution in business that you've that you've had, whether it's in any any, any one of your uh, many many uh, business scenarios that you've been in in life? Man. So, is there one that would stand out for you? Yeah, let's see here. I mean, there's definitely so many of them of going from just different places and statuses of things. But the one that's popping in mind that's probably very relevant is when I got pushed out of corporate America after 15 years and had been in that company for a long time and had you know, risen the food chain. And then I went out and I knew eventually I wanted to do that. Like as I was in, my, in the last few years of being in corporate America, I knew that eventually I was gonna wanna open my own company and I was gonna wanna do it myself versus you know running something else for everyone else. So my plan was to do it on my own terms, You know, mm -hmm. get to this level, give notice, have a transition out, keep all the, appropriate finances and all the bonuses and stuff that should come with that and then have an easy transition over to the, the next world. And that's not how it happened at all. Um, but when I went into becoming my own business owner and did that very successfully from the beginning for five years, um, I said, God, I'm finally now my own boss and I get to call all the own sh shots and all the stuff I learned for all that time was clearly so that I could adapt it here where I had more ability to be of service to others. But what happened was there's uh, too many stories to go into why, yeah. but in, in the last uh, year or so of my business, I realized that I want, that I was no longer feeling fulfilled and happy by it. And it started becoming that because of some of the constraints with my franchisor and business partners, that my dream had become my nightmare. Wow. Um, and so when you have this thing that you think you want so for so long, and all of a sudden you start waking up a little less happy, a little less passionate, a little less enthused, and it starts consuming you, and you go, wow, my dream somehow shifted into my nightmare. And I have a choice. Either I'm going to turn my nightmare back into my dream and keep on purpose because I got off track, or I'm going to get completely out of this nightmare and this dream altogether and shift course. Uh, and so um, I started on that course, and I made a decision um, that by my birthday um, of a, that particular year, that if the company wasn't sold and if I hadn't negotiated things properly with my franchisor, because I had seven years left on a real estate franchise agreement, um, that I was going to just announce I was closing down the company. And people are like, well, you can't do that. I mean, like I said, it's not my idea, not my ideal situation, but I'm no longer going to be controlled by outside uh, influences, by legal parameters, by franchisors, by partners. Uh, I'm going to make a decision that I'm completely in my control of my life, even if it may not be as beneficial impacting financially as I want it to be. But if it's, I'm hoping all works out, but if it, and this was like four months notice to yeah. myself, if I don't have it done by my birthday, November 6th, I'm taking a different direction. And during that time period, I had a lot of things happening and legal things happening, but my wife got unexpectedly um, on a deathbed. Oh, no. Uh, I'm like, how the heck did that happen? She went in for a minor surgery, ended up having a traumatic uh, you know, issue that they had a, a problem with her and she almost bled to death and was, uh, in, went into an intensive care, wow. uh, was in a coma for about three weeks, uh, had to go to a nursing home for a period of time and now she's you know, spunky as ever and she's healthy. And at the time it was, uh, do you wanna donate organs? Uh, we're not sure if she's gonna make it through the night. And in that instant, waiting to say, hey, am I going to get out of my nightmare or my dream? It made my decision for me instantly. Because the day before, all the calls and the emails and the text messages of all the stuff that I was doing that seemed so mon mon monumentally important in life that I had to take every single call and I had to return every single email, I didn't give a shit who responded to those emails or texts. Because the only thing that was important to me at that point was keeping my wife alive and whatever I could do to be by her side to help do that. But as soon as she came out of that, 
and this was like in say August or September, my birthday was still out to November. The awakening that I had by her almost dying was I for sure was going to hold myself to my word. Um, and that I had other things I was supposed to be doing and the universe was calling me to a higher place. So that transition and transformation evolution for me in business was even when it may not be financially beneficial for you, but it feels right with your soul, that mm. you must do something. You must take action on something. Follow that every time is what I learned from that. Um, and uh, it was very, very hard to step out of that thing that I had built from scratch, had dreamed about for years, but it was not going to come out smelling like all roses and champagne like I hoped it was. Uh, it came out, you know, maybe beer and peanuts um, and it wasn't too bad, but it was still not what I, and I wasn't drinking, but it, it, that analogy works. But I realized it was my financial, spiritual connection emotionally to myself of the financial, spiritual wealth that I wanted was no longer going to be held hostage by sticking to this because I felt I had to. Um, yeah. And so I made a whole transition. I gave people notice. I helped people find jobs. I parceled off pieces of the company that I was legally allowed to do so. And I reinvented myself and went out and started Alchemy Advisors uh, and, and doing what I do now and very happy with those choices. But um, what happens when people get in their nightmares? And for me, I, was, I realized that like when I was drinking, I could have stayed drinking or I could have gone and, and gone to evolution and changed. Mm -hmm. And when I was at that point in my business career of evolving, I had put so much time and energy and effort into this. It was like, I just was like, I can't let go of this. And I realized the can't let go had to become you must let go. Um, and so I, 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 yeah. I gave up the ego and the fear of doing that and trusted my higher power. And that higher power always leads me to the right place. Yeah, I think that uh, some, some real nuggets there that really just jumped out at me. Um, firstly, you know, really understanding what your priorities in life are. Um, how, how, how important does business become when you've got your loved one, uh, you know, his life hanging in the balance like you know we sit so so why do we you know put ourselves under so much pressure for that i mean i appreciate there's a whole bunch of other livelihoods at stake uh, from a business point of view i'm not naive to that but uh yeah just uh, the, the instant shift in priorities is quite amazing um but i, I love that you said that you know, always trust to do whatever feels right in your soul and um and i think that 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 is a is such a uh, you know, it's such a powerful statement, but for a lot of people, it, what feels right in my soul, we, we allow the front part of our brain here to get in the way and start judging and questioning where we go, I can't, I can't. And every time you get so locked into can't, that should tell you to your point that you must. Because yeah. when you can't, that, that intensely, because it's you justifying or judging or holding there as to reasons why you shouldn't, because you don't want to give up on um, what you're already holding on to and like the paradox of success is you know what got you to where you are won't get you where you want to go I liken it to climbing a ladder when you grab hold of the next rung you, you can't still you're not climbing the ladder in terms if you haven't let go of the one below you right. you're, you're going to put the hand up to, right. to do that so if you're saying yeah, this is what feels right in my soul but I'm saying I can't let go of this bottom one well then you're never going to go anywhere that's so true right yep. um, and right. I know I, I believe uh, you and I have both sky been, been skydiving well, yeah, we have. I was gonna. You were saying that analogy. It reminded me of the ladder guy here. Yeah. And and, and oh, this yeah. is Mar this is Marshall yeah, okay. Goldsmith of what got you here won't get you there. Yeah, but, there you go. But it's the it's the uh, the arm of trying to reach when you're not letting go of something and realizing that changing that operating system or evolving. Yeah. is the same analogy of you're talking about with the hands. It's, yeah. it's our psyche, our, our soul, our heart, and then the other process with hands is the physical, which we can see. Yeah. Uh, but good stuff. So anyway, I cut you off. You were saying what? You were no, asking no, no, to me, I just think that that's is the important part to understand is that, that, that if you, you know, from we, we get trapped, and you were talking about that, you're trapped sometimes that we're in the trappings of success. That and we, we just that and so I just love the fact that when you talk about can't versus must, like is when it just sit there thinking, what are all the times where I've said, no, I can't, I can't, I can't. But really, what that means is that that I must, and uh, and I thank you for sharing that because to me it was really uh, that was that just like that was a brick upside my own head because I'm instantly reflected on a whole bunch of things where I'm going, no, I can't do this because I can't, I can't, I can't. Yeah, and I just realized, you know what, that means that I must. I wrote it in here, can't equals must. So every time I catch myself saying I can't at that intense level, then that's probably telling me that I should. 
or I must yeah. in this case. Well, and that's great. That's a great catch and a great uh, drill down on that. And you're yeah. absolutely 100% right. And what I realized from my own thing of I was analyzing why I have these cans on things. Well, I can't do that. I can do it. It's usually because there's so much tied in the can't to mm -hmm. what other people will think or who else I think I'm responsible for. Yeah. And that I'm responsible for their happiness. I'm responsible for their financial well being. And as an owner and an operator, you are. Um, but it doesn't mean it's like if you're in a, in a situation they talk about on the plane, you know, if the plane's starting to go down, they say, grab your mask and put your mask on first and then help everybody else. When you're at that transitional place in life where you're at the can't and the must and the can't and the must and you're really struggling with things, to be able to help all of those people that you are, think are relying on you, we all also have to realize as much as we're here to be of service and we're, we're here to contribute to others and we're here to help in the overall ecosystem of the world and the universe, and I believe that's absolutely true, mm -hmm. I also re realize I'm not responsible for somebody else's happiness. I'm not responsible for somebody else's path. I'm not yeah. responsible to, you know, so... And that goes for my wife and for my kids as well. I mean, I bring it to a level of, I have responsibilities as a father and a husband, et cetera, but I am not responsible for certain things at their soul level. So when I'm talking about right. the soul level, that's where the, the must comes from. When you get to that point that the must voice starts coming out, that's different than the heart. I, I, I mean, we all have these thoughts and stuff that we contemplate and we go back and forth mm -hmm. and we're kind of, you know, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde or we're schizophrenic on what we should do or shouldn't do. And then a lot of people say, well, follow your heart. And that's enough, that takes you from those thoughts into more of emotion. And emotion helps you make decisions on how you would feel about something. And that absolutely helps. And I think that's great. Follow your heart. What I believe is the next evolution of that on, for me, on a daily basis is um, following my soul. And mm. what, what does my soul think about it? And the difference between the emotion and people say, what's the difference between heart and soul? Well, to me, heart is still um, at a level that's too connected to mind and thinking. Uh, right. It's emotion and mind where soul is all of that completely combined and tapping into something beside yourself that you're acknowledging is something beside yourself. So it's tapping into higher source. Uh, and so when you're saying I'm following my soul, that's different than following my own heart. The soul to me is connected to the bigger energy of life and the soul is just connected to you and your mind. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I love that. Like, you're like the king of analogies or metaphors like that. It's, uh, it's so easy to understand when you talk about it in, in that fashion. And I'll, uh, I appreciate you, you sharing that. Um, I'm also conscious of time and, and your time. A uh, couple other quick things. And one other question I have for you uh, is future. What are you seeing? So in the future work, future of leadership um, as a as an entrepreneur that you are, um, what, what do you see as the future of you know, in the next three years that's coming our way that, we, that business owners, leaders might need to be mindful of um, in terms of evolution, um, ourselves, what are you seeing or what are you not seeing? Yeah, what, what, I, what I'm seeing and what I'm not seeing, let's see, what I'm seeing is for sure these kinds of communications with technology and Zoom and a more virtual world is going to become just more like daily practice. And I think it's really going to affect <coughs> uh, bricks and mortar businesses. I mean, I've been in the real estate business, you know, for 15, 20 years, helping people buy and sell houses or uh, leasing buildings myself or owning bills as a commercial business owner. And I think that the world of how people are using physical spaces is going to dramatically shift and change. And all businesses are going to completely shift, I think, uh, the importance of brick and mortar and retail or even business in general. So I think that's one. I think communication of giving employees more choice and flexibility and realizing that they're gauging productivity at home or not and realizing how that can be a benefit. Um, and I also think that collaboration with businesses that have been very challenged, that there's going to be much more of a unified collective um, uh, rainbow of umbrella, if you would, of colors with different businesses collaborating in ways to have, you know, in the, inter in the uh, online business, they call it joint venture type stuff where you're in joint yeah. ventures and you're selling this. I think a lot more companies are going to look at that. Uh, and I think there's going to also be a lot more online social connection through social selling. Uh, one of the clients that I sit on a board for is a social selling company where you're not just interacting on social media, but you're taking that into your whole experience of learning and retail and buying products and services. So I think that the social aspect is going to change things quite a bit. Um, and I also think for leaders and employees are going to be wanting much more about this conversation you and I are having right now about purpose and meaning and that leaders uh, are going to have to be compelled or are pushed or pulled. Um, into being brave enough to talk about in their companies things like racial inequality, uh, things like spirituality, 
things like uh, more on purpose and family issues and dynamics. So I think companies that really want to dig deep and change and evolve to the next level are going to be bold enough, not just to incorporate the next technology platform or the next wave, but really to change the culture as to how deep they're going and what's acceptable and where their new boundaries are within what they're willing or not willing to do within companies that are for the betterment of the world. I think that's going to be more compelled and pushed. Yeah, and, I, and I, once again, that really gets back to our conversation about systems where you're talking about like their culture is, you know, you need to upgrade your operating system for your culture. You know, that's going to have to shift. Um, and strategy, same thing. I, you know, I've challenged a lot of businesses. I think we've been doing, I say we've been doing strategy wrong for a long time or the way we've done strategy in the past doesn't serve us today going forward. Um, and we can do a whole podcast, I'm sure you and I on that alone, and maybe we should going forward in the future. But, you know, uh, I, I just think that whole upgrading that uh, is so critical. And, you know, creating new employee experiences, uh, it, it's absolutely critical um, because that whole purpose driven, you know me, I mean, I see a world 10 or 20 years from now where every business is led on purpose first. Can you imagine, Steve, a world where every business is led on purpose first? That we're yeah. all here doing good in the world and then, hey, yeah, make money, then do even more good with that money and then repeat that cycle rather than just say, how do we make money today? Right. So I'll just do good in the beginning. You know, purpose is good business. Purpose is good for business. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's just do it. Um, yeah, you start, you start with that at your DNA at the beginning. You don't aspire to that. You make yeah. that as part of your original blueprint. Yeah. 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 And in, in the way that we, we, that we structure things and align culture and strategy now through circle sort of leadership and the, the, the business evolution process we have is that so you reverse engineer mission, your, your mission and your strategy is built from culture, not culture and strategy separated. So your DNA of your whole organization filters through every part of your organization, culturally, strateg strategically, tactically and performance wise. It's all the DNA is all there. Um, I, I believe that that is the future. And man, thank you so much for sharing that. Now, as we wrap up towards the end here, um, I have one random question I always ask every guest. And there's from 1 to 31. And you get to pick a number. You don't get to see the questions. But you get to pick a number between 1 to 31. And you must answer the question. Okay, pressure's on. Well, let's go with, since I'm celebrating 30 years of uh, marriage this week, let's go with number 30. Wow, okay, great. <laughs> no, one's, no one's picked this one yet, so this is awesome. Number 30 is... What was the one toy you wish you had growing up, but you didn't get? Ooh, let's see here. That is a good one. One toy. This, I would this have... This is inspired I, by my wife while you're thinking, because she always wanted an Easy Bake Oven, and she never got it. <laughs> yeah, I wanted... Um, I wanted one of those at the time. I'm trying to remember what it was, what it was uh, called. It's not, it wasn't a video game. Uh, Pac-Man. It was a yep. Pac-Man. You remember those things that was just like, not Pac-Man. Uh, what was the thing that you would get and it was like tennis back and forth. It was literally a stick Pong. electronically. Pong. 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 Yeah. The, 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 I wanted that so bad and my parents said, like, yeah, like a, never got that. My parents said, oh, it's not on our budget, whatever. But I'm like, I think back on that, uh, like, can you imagine the video games today compared to how cool we thought that was at the time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, you go back to the old, uh, again, like that Pong, I think it was the very first video game. Yeah. And and that was just the coolest ball, yeah. thing ever. <laughs> My friend had it at his house. I'd go get pretty good over there. But it's just being, being, being back and forth. And I wanted one, but I, I never got one of those. So late, later in life, as I moved out, I'm 17. I think I bought myself one after one of my paychecks. <laughs> yeah. And then you go, I don't know why I wanted this. <laughs> <laughs> right. So Steve Rogers' book led to gold, uh, fantastic read. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, that's alchemy is all about turning lead into gold. I also read that sometimes as lead to gold. Yeah, it, it can go either way. Lead to gold yeah. because of the alchemy uh, theme yeah. of alchemist turning lead into gold. But yeah. lead to gold um, also fit. I figured, hey, if people read it that way, that's fine. And then I've got my other book. My other book's coming out in about. Um, yes. Uh, it'll be out actually by the time this launch this uh, record. So. Our right. So the IGI principles, which is inviting good in, uh, the principles by Steve Rogers, is also be available uh, by the time this podcast launch. So please check that out. Just a quick synopsis of the book, mate, as we wrap up. IGI yeah, you principles. Were yeah, you were talking about Wayne Dyer earlier, and I used to follow Wayne and still do. And Wayne used to talk about ego. When you're in your ego that we all have, it represents edging good out or edging God out. And when I read that, I'm like, well, oh, that's really easy. When I'm in my ego, I'm edging good out, God out. So I said, what's the opposite of that? So 10 years ago, I made the uh, acronym myself of inviting good in or inviting God in, I-G-I. And I said, well, that sounds kind of like Iggy. 
Iggy. Yeah. So I like that's kind of a cool word. So I uh, saved all these domains. And over the years, I started practicing myself, my own systems and processes of a spiritual essence of inviting good and inviting God in in all areas of my life. So the Iggy principles is about in business and life, how do you constantly invite and you can determine Iggy, whatever you want it to be, yeah. God, grace, goodness, et cetera. Uh, and uh, it, it's the process of how to incorporate that thinking into your businesses. Fantastic. But I'm looking forward to reading that. I uh, always enjoy your content. If people want to reach out to Steve Rogers and they want to chat to uh, what's going on in your neighborhood or, uh, or uh, find out what part of the world you're saving as Captain America, mate, where can they best get hold of Steve Rogers? Yeah, I have a new site that just launched. I sell my old site, but I now got two running. So the easiest way would be steverogers.net. And Rogers, unlike Mr. Rogers, has a D in it. So it's R-O-D-G-E-R-S. But steverogers.net. Um, and uh, I've got all my stuff on there with blogs and, you know, uh, social media click-throughs and, uh, you know, different things. So uh, that'd be the best way to reach me. Right. Awesome. So please, everybody, check out uh, steverogers.net. Uh, and also grab Steve's books off of Amazon, Lead, uh, Lead to Gold. I see, I always want to say Lead to Gold. Lead to Gold. Uh, and uh, I'm coming out the Iggy IGI principles. Uh, it will be a fantastic read. And I think there's something special about inviting good or God into your life. And, uh, and I love that uh, instead of edging the goodness out, let's invite it in. Uh, thank you again for joining us on the Evolution of Business show, mate. I really appreciate having you uh, on the show and uh, look forward to. Uh, catching up again when we're allowed out of our rooms, <laughs> when international <laughs> travel allows us again. Yeah, absolutely. Well, my pleasure. Always great to connect with you and keep up the great work you're doing. I'm going to continue to listen to your shows and, and evolve myself. Thank you, mate. Much appreciated.